we've been talking about for many, many years, which is the mid-trimester targeted scan. And I believe if this was implemented in the way it is, should have been done, by now our detection rate of anomalies should have been very, very high. Which means birth rate of lethal abnormalities should have gone down drastically. That even though over the years it has come down, but I believe there is still, we are still a long way to go. Now, one major thing that has changed over the last decade, I should say, especially over the last five years, is the shifting of the targeted scan from the second trimester to the first trimester. So today in our center, almost 72% of all abnormalities are diagnosed before 13 weeks, including close to about 60% of cardiac anomalies. So this means there is a big opportunity in the first trimester to do a detailed anatomical evaluation. And what filters through to the second trimester will be those that were missed in the first trimester and or the patient did not have an opportunity to have a scan in the first trimester and then they come on to the second trimester. But nevertheless, the second trimester scan is uh, literally the, still the cornerstone uh, in it. If somebody has to have a single scan, then maybe they will say still second trimester scan is valid. So I'll take you through a little bit of introduction. Uh, then we take it into three parts. Part one, the seven basic steps to the second trimester scan, then the rule of three approach. Then I also tell you something about the ESWOG approach. And then we how to perform the targeted scan and also common anomalies. And then so a little bit of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, now, the importance of the need to standardize. First of all, we need to standardize the performance of the scan itself by taking standard planes of section, by defining anatomical landmarks, and also have a checklist approach. Now, this uh, uh, book by Atul Gawande is something which everybody would have read, which really changed the face of healthcare by using a checklist all the time. The interpretation depends on the correct plane, accurate measurements, and very precise definitions. What is pelvic thesis versus hydronephrosis? What is ventriculomegaly versus hydrocephalus? And also the ability to audit our images and go back and say, yes, I did perform this in the right way, but the anomaly was not present at the time I did the scan. It has evolved over a period of time. Now, we know that almost all international organizations have produced guidelines. And they produce guidelines for performance of routine mid trimester scan, the AIUM, the uh, ISWAG. So we will stick to ISWAG because I'm part of the ISWAG Educational Committee. And the basic training curriculum uh, in that uh, group, uh, we had sat together and worked out what is the minimum information that is required that needs to be done during a routine uh, scan. So the guidelines are intended to reflect what is considered to be currently the best practices at the time they were issued and just setting achievable standards. That is, we want if somebody follows the guideline, everybody should be able to follow the guideline. We can't keep a very high standard and say, I will include uh, looking at the ear of every baby or the eyelashes of every baby and then say that only 10% of the people are able to do it. So the anatomical structures that can be seen is dictated actually by the desire to see and the equipment, the operator skill, commitment and the time spent. The more time you spend with the baby, the more information you will be able to pick it up. That There is no doubt about that. But the thing is, what is it that we need to see? Even though we can see a lot, what is it that we need to see? The, uh, the question of how much uh, we can see is almost anything that we want. For example, here, I'm able to see the esophagus, the thin line which is going there. And here, actually, I can see the eyelashes of the baby. And this picture, mind you, was taken 10 years old the, with a machine which is 10 years old. So today, with the current equipment, we can do even much more better. Right. So how much we want to see, we will be able to see. Now I'll take you through a very simple approach, which we call as the rule of three approach. Now let's understand first three things. When we all know when we start scanning, but 
do we ask ourselves when we stop scanning is it goes by time is it a time allotted to the patient or is it you feel have a sense of satisfaction that you have completed the job or you feel whatever you need to see you have seen uh, so we need to know when to stop scanning secondly we want to identify common anomalies and also identify fetuses who require an expert opinion so we should be able to say this heart does not seem to be all right this stomach i am not happy about the way it appears this ventricle shape appears abnormal these are triggers that happen which helps us to uh, refer the patient to the next level center so iswa came up with this basic training program it is now entirely available online and in that one of the lectures is the 20 plane approach as we call it but almost in the year uh, 1995 uh, we evolved uh, we evolved a, a method called called the 7 plus 3 is equal to 10 approach the 7 plus 3 steps is seven steps of the obstetric scan and there are three anatomical planes that need to be seen in each part of the body and in each part of the each plane we look at three anatomical landmarks so it's very easy to remember as we go by so the seven basic steps are history survey biometry targeted scan fetal activity fetal environment and each of these steps has got an absolute relevance and has Uh, to get a final good result we need to go through all these steps today of course we are going to talk about the targeted scan now just to say a few words about history taking why do we take history because we want to know approximately what gestational age because the anatomical structure which you see depends on the gestational age if she is dates are off by about 3 to 4 weeks then you are you need to revise your uh, anatomical expectation from that from the uh, patient second is to classify a pregnancy as high risk or low risk to identify also specific risk factors during the scan and also to answer the mother's expectations i think very important what is she coming what expectations is she coming with for example a 22 year old second gravida first child is down syndrome you do the scan and say scan is normal the mother thinks you have excluded down syndrome because for her that's the only answer she wants second is the first, another primary who comes to the first cousin with duchenne muscular dystrophy she wants to know whether her baby is having dmd and and third pregnant person first child cerebral palsy or autism she wants to know whether you can rule out autism so there are certain levels of expectation with the parents have and what is it what we must know our limitations and counsel them accordingly so when we do this detailed history it helps us to do this the second part of the obstetric scan is to do a survey i always believe that doing a survey is like going to a friend's house during their house warming ceremony now when you go for the first time to their house what they will do is to take you around they will take you around to all the rooms and remember that the last time you will be able to go around the house so once you go around you know where the kitchen is where the um, uh, where the bedroom is and where the children's room is so on and so forth and remember the kitchen is equal to the placenta so the kitchen is the back of the house the right of the house the left of the house wherever it is you can do that my while going through that you will be able to see a global anatomy fetal number viability life placental location and subject to life time this takes only about 5 to 10 seconds to do this but this survey is a very very important step the next step is the biometry uh, where we assess gestational age assign gestational age if it is the first scan assess growth if gestational age has been assigned earlier and we do bpd hc ac fl remember that biometry assigning gestational age is by head circumference in the second trimester the uh, <clears throat> the next step is to targeted scan which is essentially a head to toe clinical examination basically to prove normality to identify patients for repeat scans and also to identify major structural abnormalities now once we um, so next is fetal environment in fetal environment we look at three things again placenta like current cord we'll come back to that later and then 
we, we look at fact fetal activity as we do the scan and then final step is the reporting the reporting we have to provide meaningful reports and images which convey the findings and conclusion from each step so you take one sentence from each of these steps will actually form a very nice structured report and we need to document what is not seen a few years ago we published this paper in the journal of fetal medicine the second trimester obstetric can 7 plus 3 is equal to 10 and anyone who wants a copy of this is available with me and, and we are happy to send it to you if you uh, email email me so three fetal trimesters three fetal regions three views sagittal transverse and coronal and three anatomical landmarks in each plane this is what we expect to do to predict with confidence the structural normalcy to identify severe lethal abnormalities to raise suspicion of the abnormality the next is uh, the issue of 20 to 20 plus 2 plane approach is sort of incorporates the rule of three insight and it says we it's mainly meant to provide structured and logical method of examining the mid-trimester features by assessing fetal size by performing an anatomical review that has the potential to exclude 50 abnormal appearances so by doing this approach we can exclude 50 anomalies and i'll tell you what those anomalies are as we go by now what are the two plus 20 plates the it is a combination of two overview sweeps and 20 planes divided into seven anatomical areas of the fetus now each plane refers to a specific fetal section or view measurements to be taken are included every plane has got a number of structures to be evaluated the criteria for referral is also included and a combination that enable the potential exclusion of 50 abnormal appearances now how do these planes relate to the iswag bt recommendation mainly um, you realize that the there are several recommendation practice guidelines and the entire thing has been brought out with these guidelines into view. So let's go to the overview. The first plane or the overview plane, which we call it as. We call it as a sweep. There are two sweeps and 20 planes. The first sweep is longitudinal head and body for initial orientation. What do you, the, 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 pair, the lady is lying down on the table. So we need to use our probe to quickly go through from pubic symphysis to all the way to the fundus and make a quick round of the fetus. We are not going to provide any diagnosis, but we are going to say determination of fetal presentation and life. We want to detect cardiac activity, identification of the number of fetuses in the uterus, determination of location and position of the placenta, estimation of amniotic fluid, and also fetal biometric measurement. And the seventh one, of course, is the reporting which we will talk about. Now, so now let's look at fetal presentation and life. What you do is you use your probe transversely. You use your probe transversely and swing your probe down all the way into the cervix. Yeah. When you do that, you will see what is the presenting part. If the presenting part of the head, we know it's cephalic, the baby is cephalically oriented. And if it breaches, you know it's breech presentation. Now, this is important because remember, this fetus in the second trimester is going to keep moving around all the time. But at the time of your examination, you quickly want to do this because that will tell you where the spine of the baby is and from there we need to do a rotation technique we always rotate the probe and all the observed fundus and again and then you rotate your probe in the anti clockwise direction and when you do that we, it gives you some remarkable information what it does is, if you take a four, picture, uh, four quarter picture like this, the head is down, and you can see we, we want this to, uh, we want to ensure that we get these pictures and. Sorry. Sorry, I think these annotations are coming. I'm not asking for it to come and it's just coming. Okay, so 
This helps us to identify right and left sides of the fetus. Now, how do we do that? Because once you have a cross section of the fetal abdomen, you see the spine, then you look at structures, stomach, total weight. Spine, stomach, total weight. Remember, this must flow in the clockwise direction. And if the baby is in breech position, then this structure, spine, stomach, and total weight will always go in the anti-clockwise direction. The moment you identify this, this will tell you that the fetus, the situs of the fetus is normal and the structures are located where they are expected to be located. So here's a breech position. You can see the, the bottom is down. Then this is the spine, stomach, and the spine and stomach and portal vein is going in the anti-clockwise direction. And so the, uh, the, the place side where the stomach is will also be the apex of the heart. So that is that tells us that the situs is fine here. So we've identified, uh, once we've identified this, we have finished the overview plane. And what is the report we can get out of this? A single in live intrauterine gestation, placenta anterior, amniotic fluid adequate. This is something which we have seen as we go and many times as we, we see, even the fetal activity, the cardiac activity will be seen Sometimes the baby will also be able to see, will be, be moving, which is fine with us. We have still not done the biometric measures. Right. Next is, let's move, start moving through those 20 planes. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, a picture here, which is going to tell you what is plane one. Now, remember, if you want to get a good view of the fetus, good anatomical evaluation of the fetus, you must control the spine of the fetus. The moment you know the spine is under your control, which means with your probe, you can move through the spine from the cervical spine to the sacral spine, back and forth, which, uh, the way you like it, and all the time keeping the two spine, uh, the, the parallel view of the spine clearly in view, then you have controlled the spine. So this is called as plain wine. It's a sagittal complete spine with skin covering. And so you can see the as you move along, that is your sagittal spine which is being covered. Okay, then you just move a little bit. Um, you come come a little bit towards the abdomen, and you get the coronal view of the spine. And you also get a coronal section of the body. There, this is the coronal section of the body. So this is a quick three plane approach, go to the sagittal section of the spine, move your spine towards the side of the baby so that you get coronal, side, coronal view of the baby, get the spine, then you also get the abdomen. So posterior coronal view will get the spine and anterior coronal view will get you uh, the abdomen. So these are three planes. Next is plane four, five, six. Now from here, what we'd like to do, always go back to the spine. So now you can see I'm going back to the spine here and I will specifically come to this point where the cervical spine meets the occiput, right? And when you do that, and I just rotate my probe 90 degrees from plane one and two, I just go here and rotate my probe 90 degrees and I get the transverse view of the uh, head, the, the lateral ventricular plane, then you will get your uh, the transthalamic plane with the cavum system, pellucidum, and the transcerebellar plane. All these three planes are obtained here. So plane four, five, six is nothing but the cranial planes which are there. Now just to show how the probe moves, that's your probe. It goes up, and then you do a transverse view, and then you can get the whole thing again. So always get the cervical spine and occiput, then move your probe 90 degrees, and then move up and down uh, with a little bit of rotation, you will be able to get all the three anatomical planes of the head. Next is plane seven, eight, nine, ten. So four, five, six is the head. Seven, eight, nine, ten is the thorax. Now it's very important because there are 16 anomalies that can be diagnosed in this with these four planes, right? Lungs, fourth chamber view, right and left ventricular outflow tract. And uh, 
the crossover of the LVOT, RVOT, and the three vessel, three vessel trachea view of the heart. You can see the four chamber view. As you move closely, it becomes the uh, LVOT, RVOT. We'll come back to that in a minute. You'll get the entire view as we go along. Right, so that's your three vessel view and the three vessel trachea view. Now, color Doppler now has almost become uh, mandatory to see the flow uh, in all these planes. But if you just have a B mode and you're able to view these structures, that should be fine enough. Right, so just see the four chamber view now. Slowly I'm moving upwards, you can see the LVOT. And as you go, this is the RVOT. And then see, you can see the three vessel, three vessel trachea view. So it's very quickly this can be done. And that you actually, and while you do that, you can see that uh, we have actually seen as we go along the two lungs on both sides of the heart, the two lungs are very well seen and the spaces are completely empty. Sometimes you can see a very thin rim of fluid in the, around the pericardial space, which is fine. And usually the pleural space is empty. Next is we go to plane 11, 12, 13 and 14. What are these? Now, we started off with plane 10, that is three vessel trachea view. That's where we finished the last this one. Then we come down to the abdomen. We do a transfer section of the abdomen from plane, plane 10. We slide our probe down to plane 11, which is the transverse view of the abdomen at the level of the cord insertion. And that, I think, is important. There, that's the cord insertion side which you're seeing. This cord insertion must be documented in every single case, right? And then we try, we go transfer section of the kidney. Now it's, it's easier done if the spine is anterior, but you can always wait for the spine to come anterior and do that. And as you go down the transfer section of the bladder and the two umbilical arteries. So plane 11, 12, 13, and 14. So, we have now finished the examination of the uh, abdomen. We have, we have finished the examination of the head, spine, head, thorax, and abdomen. Now we come to the extremities, which is yes. plane 15, 16, and 17. So can I now, just request every participant not to use annotations? It's disturbing the speaker's screen as well and everyone. Please do not use annotations. Do not scribble on your screen. It is reflecting on the screen and disturbing the speaker. Please, I request you. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, plane 15, 16, and 17 are the extremities. We started or we finished at the level of the pelvis and bladder. And very easy from the pelvis and bladder, we just move down. Immediately, you will start seeing that's uh, the femur. Right? The moment you see the femur, try to get the femur as horizontal as possible. And from then on, we move, uh, rotate the probe so that you will get the uh, leg and the foot. Now, it's important to see both feet at the same level, telling you that both the, uh, the segments of the limb are equal. Then we look at the feet. We actually don't need to count the toes, but the, the, the relationship of the leg to the foot, the right angle relationship must be uh, evaluated. Then we go on to, um, as we go by, we finish the lower limb and then we go on to the upper limb. So in the upper limb, you can see that uh, you move the probe from the, sorry, you move the probe uh, along the spine and then you come to the, near the thorax and then move your probe forwards, you will see the upper limbs coming up there. So that's your radius and ulna, that's your humerus, and that's your radius and ulna, and that's your fingers. Now, one thing we always do and ensure in, uh, in our own institution is we always wait for the baby to open, the, the baby has opened his hands now. One opening and closing is very essential because this is the one, uh, uh, one feature which is going to help you to identify whether the baby has got uh, arthrogryphos, if the limbs are not moving very much, if the baby is having his hands clenched, then we look for either trisomy 18 or, uh, or um, uh, restrictive lesions, the musculoskeletal lesions which are there. So the three bones of arms, uh, hands, everything is done. 
Next, of course, plane 18, 19, and 20. Right? We have almost come to the end of the anatomical evaluation. This plane 18, 19, and 20 is you start off with the head, transventricular plane, where you can see this is where you start off with the head and then move your probe 90 degrees to see the coronal view of the face. And that's the coronal view of the face which is coming up now. And as I'm moving, I can see the orbits and the lens on both eyes. That is the posterior coronal view. The mid coronal view will give you the pre maxillary triangle. And as you go further, you can see the mouth. You have to wait for the baby to uh, come to position. There. You can see the mouth there. It, it's actually a very, there. You can see the mouth opening and closing. Now, it's, it's very uh, fortunate if you have the mouth open and close there. You can see the mouth open and close. Mouth open and close. Now, this mouth opening and closing is the only way you will be able to identify if it is an isolated cleft lip. If there's a cleft palate, then you'll already see a gap. But if it is just a plain cleft lip, only when the mouth opens, the lips will uh, uh, be a isolated cleft lips get missed on the ultrasound. If, because the, you don't look for opening and closing. Then, of course, we should also do the mid-sagittal view. So the face consists of three parts, orbits, nose, and mouth. We look at three planes. That is the mid-sagittal view, the transverse view, and the axial view. See, the coronal view, the axial view, and the mid-sagittal view. So three planes, three structures to be evaluated uh, in the face. Now, once you have done that, we have now completed the anatomical evaluation of the fetus. When performed correctly, the 20 plus 2 plane approach has the potential to include 50 abnormal appearances. Actually, it is much more, but the ISWOG has stuck to these 50 because they said at least this we should be able to achieve. Now, sweep 1, we find one abnormality. Sweep 1 to 3, spine 6 abnormalities. Head 8 abnormalities. Thorax 16 abnormalities. Abdomen 8, pelvis 3, limbs 3, face 5, and then total 50 abnormality. So let's quickly see. I'm not going to read through this list. Don't be uh, worried. But just to tell you what are all the things that can be done, which is what is provided. But I'm going to break that and I'm going to show you some of these anomalies and how they are related to that particular view. So first is a sweep. What is a sweep? We say we're just moving the probe, pubic symphysis in the transverse, look at the presenting part and then move the probe around. In that, you will certainly be able to identify the head of the baby. And if the head is absent, then the diagnosis of anencephaly is easily made. But today, I will be very, very concerned if somebody diagnoses anencephaly in the second trimester targeted scan. Because almost all anencephalies must be diagnosed in the first trimester at 11 to 14 weeks. So you should not be, uh, you should not have the opportunity to see anencephaly in the second trimester. Now let's look at plane one to three. We look at abnormal so anomalies two to seven: left side diaphragmatic ania, meningocele, and uh, open spina bifida, and so on. So situs inverses. So how do we diagnose situs inverses? Here is a baby in cephalic presentation, right? And that's the occiput. So spine, stomach, and portal vein are going in the anti-clockwise direction. So we said initially, spine, stomach, and portal vein must go in the clockwise direction. Here, spine, stomach, and portal vein going in the anti-clockwise direction. The apex of the heart is also on the same side of the stomach. So this baby, cephalic presentation, all the organs, both the abdominal organs and the heart are inverted. So this is situs inversus totalis. Now here we have, in the thorax, you can see uh, stomach, and you can see the heart is being pushed to one side. So obviously, it is a left-sided diaphragmatic tunnel. And then here, in, in you can see the um, um, a meningocele, sacral meningocele, and here is a sacral uh, meningomyelocele, which is seen there. And then we also identify sacral agenesis, as you can see. The tip of the sacrum is not seen. We should always look for the curvature of the sacrum. Usually happens around 20 to 21 weeks or so. 
or if there's a solid tumor, it's a sacrococcal teratoma. Most often the sacrococcal teratoma, then you use color Doppler to see the vascularity. Right. Then as a byproduct, this is not, ISWOG has not recommended that you will diagnose these anomalies, but once you see a spine which is deformed, then you can see that the vertebral bodies are mismal aligned here. So these are called vertebral segmentation defects or hemivertebrae. You can also have scoliosis or sometimes you can see a bright spot within the spine which gives you the diagnosis of diastomatomalia which is a split cord malformation. So these are additional things which you can see. One is a low bar holoprosencephaly. Again, if you see this picture, this is a 12-week scan. A low bar holoprosencephaly should be diagnosed 100% of the time by 12 weeks. It should not come to the second trimester at all. But ventricular galley can come in the second trimester, and ventricular this can also be uh, if it is associated with an abnormal shaped skull like a lemon-shaped skull, and also a banana-shaped cerebellum, then we know there's obviously an open neurotrip defect. Then we can also see an occipital encephalosy. Sometimes the occipital encephalosy can be very, very small and can easily be missed. And you should also remember, sometimes the baby can have its hand behind the head and the fingers may look like an encephalosy, which you have to be very careful about. Now, ventricular megaly, as you lot know, is when the lateral ventricle width is more than 10 millimeters, we call it a ventricular megaly. Up to uh, 15 millimeters, 10 to 12 millimeters, we call it as mild. Then 15 to 12 to 15, we got moderate. And more than 15 millimeters, we call it as severe ventricular megaly. And we also look at the shape of the ventricle. And if the shape of the ventricle is not the frontal horn and the occipital horn, both are dilated here. Here, the occipital horn alone is dilated the frontal horn being pinched, and this gives you a typical diagnosis of colpocephaly or callosal agency. When you come to the posterior fossa, uh, uh, a posterior fossa cyst uh, could give you a diagnosis of a dandy walker malformation if both cerebellar hemispheres are kyphoplastic and pushed aside. Here you can see a completely worm absence of the worm is there, and, uh, or you can have an enlarged cyst in a magna. And remember, all positive processes are not dandy You could also have what is called the Blake process, which is mimicking a dandy walker malformation. We need to do some extra planes uh, and possibly a little sound to, to sort out the diagnosis. Then in plane 7 to 10, as I said, thorax, cardiac abnormalities, I won't go through the list. But in the lung also, specific abnormalities, lungs which are expanded, you can see the concave. Here you can see the lung, but here you can see the lung border is convex. The reason why it's convex is because the trachea is obstructed and there's a lot of fluid accumulation in the lung. And because of that, that the intra-lung pressure is very high and there is a eversion of the convexity of the lung surface. So this tells you this is a congenital high airway malformation or chaos. Then we look for pleural effusion and pericardial effusion, uh, which could also be there. Now, so this is the typical congenital high airway malformation is there. Now, plane 7 to 10, the other cardiac anomalies, I'm not going to go into details of anomalies, but certainly to say hypoplastic left heart, hypoplastic right heart, Epstein's anomaly, and uh, various other cardiac anomalies can be diagnosed. Now, planes 11 to 14, you have ascites, small, absent stomach, duodenal atresia, uh, ecogenic bowel, gastroschisis, omphalocele, bilateral renal agenesis, renal pelvic dilatation. Um, all this can be seen. Now, plane 11 to uh, and 12, normally, I will give you a small diagnostic conundrum here. Sure. Remember, in any anatomical part, mm -hmm. if you see more than what you should see or if you don't see what you are expected to see there is an anomaly right so how do you, i'll repeat that again if you see more than what you should see or if you don't see what you expect to see 
there is an abnormality. I'll explain that in the pictures. Normally, upper abdominal descent, we have seen so far when it takes sections of the upper abdomen, you expect to see the stomach. So I'm stomach is there. But am I seeing something more than the stomach? Yes, I'm seeing something more. And second thing is, is it communicating with the stomach? Yes, it is communicating with the stomach. So this is called the double bubble appearance and that's due to attrition. Similarly, am I seeing more, this is the point where the umbilical cord should enter. At the point where umbilical cord is entering, the, the umbilical cord and the abdominal wall should be intact. Here the abdominal wall is not intact and you can see the bowel which is floating in the amniotic fluid. So obviously we are seeing more than what we should see and that is gastroschisis. Here again an abdominal wall defect but with a covering and the umbilical cord you can see coming aside and it's inserting on top. So this is an omphalocene. Now once you see go down below the level of the stomach, we normally don't see, we see the normal large bubble as you go well into the second trimester, 23-24 weeks, we start seeing large bubble, but you can, and the large bubble sizes, there are standard sizes for various gestational ages which you can see, uh, the diameters or the tables are available, but here with one look you can see there is a large dilated loop of bubble, the moment you say that this is probably an obstructed bowel, which is there. Right. Next is, we come to plane 13-14. And this plane 13-14, we always, always in all fetuses, do a coronal section of the body with the iota, which is running there. And we always switch on the color. And we switch on the color, we expect on both sides that it need to be present and the two renal arteries to come on both sides. Here you can see the iota which is quite bare and there are no renal arteries on both sides. But you can see the adrenal glands which are lying down there. So these are called lying down adrenals, no branch of the renal arteries on that. So this is bilateral renal agenesis. And here in the transverse section of the kidney, you can see renal pelvis dilatation as I said. In the second trimester, uh, between 4 and 7 mm, the renal pelvis is fine. Only beyond 7 mm, we call it as abnormal. But, uh, and we call it as urinary tract dilatation uh, type A1. And then if it is more than 7 mm, and the calicial dilatation is there, then we call it as urinary tract dilatation um, as A2. Now, in this uh, video, you are seeing something more. What's happening is this kidney is... There are lots of cystic spaces in the kidney on both sides. One side is more than the other. And these cysts are not communicating with each other. So here is one large cyst. And obviously the calicial dilatation is here. Here the cysts are individual uh, with varying sizes and not communicating with each other. So this means this is a cystic dysclastic kidney which you are seeing. Whereas this is a hydronephrotic uh, kidney. Now, next is, of course, uh, uh, when you come down to the bladder, when you see upper tract dilatation, we always look at the bladder. And if the bladder is distended and you see a dilated posterior urethra, then the diagnosis of lower urinary tract obstruction. We do not write posterior urethral valves in our reports. We, have, we do not report posterior urethral valves. You always say lower urinary tract dilatation, LUTO. That is the standard terminology now, which you should uh, which you should use. Now, planes 15 to 17, we are now coming to the extremities, right? We look at uh, skeletal dysplasia, talipus, rock or bottom foot, and also fixed infection deformities of the wrist. So here, talipus is easily identified. If you are able to see the leg and the foot, when you see the full leg with the two bones, tibia and fibula, you are not expected to see the toes. So here toes are seen and the foot is not at right angles uh, to the leg. So that's a talipus as you can see. You can see a convexity of the toe. Here again, simple rule of three for bone is length, echogenicity and shape. 
Now, when you see the length of the bone, it gives you femur, as it gives you the gestational age and say, okay, this femur is growing appropriate. The echogenicity, the brightness of the bone, gives you the index of mineralization of the bone. If the bone is poorly mineralized, then the bone will not be bright enough and the shadowing behind the bone will not be good enough. Then the shape of the bone. Here you can see the shape is completely altered. It could be because of campomelic dysplasia, it could be because of oxygen imperfecta. But remember one thing, we never give a skeletal dysplasia diagnosis antenatally. We only say the bone is short, the bone is deformed, then a detailed evaluation has to be done after the delivery of the baby. We have to take an x-ray. Sometimes you need to do molecular testing before you can come and label the skeletal dysplasia. Because if you label it as achondroplasia or thanatophoric dwarfism or osteogenic imperfecta, that label, that diagnosis will stick for the patient and future counseling will depend on what you have given. So you have to be very careful to draw the line and say these are short long bones maybe lethal because the thoracic circumference is very small so maybe it's a lethal skeletal dysplasia or non lethal skeletal dysplasia here in the foot here you can see an ectrodactyly which is there right now here again you can see the uh, in real time the talipus which is we can see all the toes and you can see tibia and fibula together at the same time all the toes are visible Right, it's a rocker bottom. Right, now next quarter, let's go to plane 18 to 20. Now, cleft lip, anophthalmia, cataract, proboscis, so on and so forth. So here, in the mid-sagittal view of the fetus, you can see severe micrometia. And in the, uh, the mid-coronal view, you can see the pre triangle is not closed. So there is a severe, uh, uh, large cleft, facial cleft, which is there. And this baby has got uh, a central cleft hip, which is, which, is palp, which is there. So we have finished the 20 planes. All whatever we need to examine and see uh, the anomalies that could possibly be seen there. There's much more we can do, but if, for doing a routine screening, if you achieve this much, this itself is absolutely fantastic. Now, when you go to the fetal environment, placenta, sliker, and cord. In the placenta, we always look at the relationship for the lower edge to the internal os. Whether it's covering the os, up to the os, and less than two centimeters from the os is uh, called low line. And look for adherence in high risk cases. Here, uh, this is a transvaginal examination. We have to be very careful when you're seeing the placenta transabdominally with a full bladder because it can give you false information. So always do a transvaginal and identify the uh, lower edge of the placenta internal loss. Now you can also can identify adherent placenta spectrum. We can't go into details now, but look for look for those lacunar spaces and the absence of the space behind the placenta, uh, retroplacental space. Here you can see an invasion of the placenta into the bladder, which is a percreta, which is there. there. Now, like her, there are three methods of adjust, uh, assessment: subjective, single deepest pool, vertical pool, and AFI. We do not report amniotic fluid index in the second trimester. Subjective is good enough, but when you feel it looks like you subjectively you feel a little less, always do the single deepest vertical pool. The single deepest vertical pool, less than two centimeters is oligohydramnios, more than eight centimeters is polyhydramnios. So this is what we need to we need to do. And then when you look at the umbilical cord. We look for three vessels always below the bladder. I mean, at the level of the bladder, two umbilical. This is the only way you should do, look for single umbilical artery. If you look at it, you look at it in the umbilical cord, many times errors can come, but this is the best place to do with color dog. And placenta, three areas. Placental attachment, free loop, and entry into the abdomen. We already saw entry into the abdomen. We look at the free loop just to say that, yes, there are a lot of free loops there, and placental attachment, because this is a centrally located uh, attachment of the cord into the placenta. If there's a velamentous attachment, especially in a monocoronary twins, we know that that twin is highly, uh, there's a high chance the baby will have selective intrauterine growth restriction. So any velamentous attachment on a cord can lead to growth restriction because the territory of the placenta that supplies the baby will be lesser. 
Now, the ISWAG has also brought out the criteria for referral. Once you do the 20 plus 2 plane approach, now they say any appearance which is not normal, uh, in plane 4 to 6, if the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle is greater than 10 millimeters and BPD and HC is outside the normal range of the chart, that is less than 5th centile or greater than 95th centile. Similarly, abdominal circumference outside the range of the side chart, one or both renal pelvis greater than 7 millimeters, dandruff posterior diameter, and femur length outside of the normal range of the chart, then the, these patients require next level referral. So the key points are working through the two overview planes and 20 planes in the described sequence, provides a logical and time efficient examination of the whole fetus, uh, it takes uh, uh, about uh, uh, pro approximately around 18 minutes to do this entire process. Examining the fetal anatomy correctly is more important than the order in which it's. So here is what we call there is a checklist, right? Now it will be very nice if all babies allow us to go in the sequence, but the fetal position may be that you may not be able to go in sequence. So we call what is known as an opportunistic imaging. That is, if the fetal spine is posterior, quickly go and examine the heart. Because in the next few minutes, the, people may, the baby may roll around and the spine may become anterior and you won't be able to see the heart. So be an opportunist, but make sure you have the checklist and tick off whatever has been seen. So before the patient goes off the table, use a checklist and check out whatever things are done or what, what is not done. And the role, our role is to distinguish between the range of normal and abnormal appearance in the mid trimester fetus and any appearance which you cannot confirm as normal should be referred for a more experienced opinion, not simply say, come back after four weeks. Now, what happens is that sometimes that can be too late. So when there's a suspicion raised, it is better to sort out the suspicion then and there. And then we will see if it is an evolving problem, it's fine. If the, if the renal pelvis is uh, uh, seven millimeters, let us say, then it's fine then we can say come back in two weeks time or three weeks time i'll go and see whether the pelvis is increasing in size or not but when the uh, when the heart looks uh, large one asymmetry of the chamber then i say okay come back after four weeks by the time you have seen it normally would have been full grown the baby may go into high drops. so we have to be careful about when to uh, refer now what more can we see i said as i said whatever the mind wants to see there is evolving anatomy with gestational age uh, we have what is known as an extended neurosonogram. I'm not going to go into the details, but essentially this is to do a coronal section of the head where we can see the frontal horn, the caudate nuclei, thalamine, the sphenoid bone, uh, and the cave of the velocity through the transthalamic plane, transcerebellar plane. We can look at the head in a completely different view. And we can do a transvaginal evaluation of the fetal head for greater anatomical detail. Then the other important thing is to look at the sulcus. You can see a lateral sulcus normal here at 20 weeks. Now at 26 weeks, you, you are expecting the lateral sulcus to become smaller. Here a very wide open lateral sulcus at 26 weeks. That means this baby could be going in for lysencephaly. And here you can see normal sulci at 33 weeks. And you can see a poor sulcation at 33 weeks, telling there's a lysem cephalic. So that's a lot more diagnosis that can be made. Similarly, getting a mid-sagittal view of the vermis, and we can get what is known as the brain stem tentorium angle and the brain stem vermis angle to differentiate between dandy walker malformation and Blake's port cyst. So there are several methods of differentiating between dandy walker malformation and Blake's port cyst. So this is the plane which you need to get. As you see, the uh, vermis is pushed up. Uh, whereas here, uh, you can see the vermis is um, uh, hardly, you're able to see the vermis in this case. So just to tell you that the lens of the eye is important. Both lens of the eye must be seen. You will actually see the eyeball moving there. And here you can see a lens which is cataract. As you can see a very white area which is cataract because that points towards infection. Then the fetal adrenal glands can also be seen. You can see the right adrenal gland. Here you can see enlarged adrenal glands here, and the lying down adrenal gland in an empty fossa. And lastly, I want to tell you one thing. It is very easy to see, and this was published by Dr. Bhupati Vijayaraghavan from, from Coimbatore, 
all fetuses you can just go into the perineum and you can see this small little dot which is there this is the anal orifice and this is called as the perianal muscular complex this dark area is called the perianal muscular complex if you see this it helps you to diagnose high anorectal anomaly because if you see don't see this dot that means the the skin is completely closed there and the anal opening is not there right so the messages are the rule of 3 is a method of systematic examination of the fetus it helps us to know when to stop scanning once you finish your checklist you tell the patient you can get up i finished the checklist now there may be cases where you will not be able to achieve for example the patient is persistently the head is uh, facing down you are not able to see the face then you have to tell the patient see after some time the baby is not moving so you go you go out have a cup of coffee and come back then we will redo that and or you go and come back tomorrow i will keep your checklist pending before we close the second trimester targeted scan uh, as a complete so checklist page approach is important so provides for verifiable audit if an anomaly is missed and easily reproducible and an ideal training method for that now having said that last few uh, slides on ultrasound reporting now remember we should be meaningful you convey your thoughts in an understandable fashion and reduce the technical jargon in the conclusion using words like hypoechoic hyperechoic is not something anybody is not going to understand you need to be very technical about it so we have seen the seven steps what what we do important thing is in the second trimester scan always measure the cervical length that should come part of routine now should we report all that we see is there a standard way the syntax should it be uniform and should a report always be conclusive now here is just an example of uh, uh, an early scan which is there right and this is the early scan which is there what are you going to report this as and we have measured the gestational sac here so you ask for lmp you calculate the gestational age now first trimester prior to the fetal pole appearance we say single live intrauterine gestation at 5 weeks this is what most people will say single intrauterine gestation sac at 5 to 6 weeks intrauterine gestation sac seen sac size corresponds to 5 weeks which of these is right obviously the third one is right because you are only see a gestation sac you still don't know whether the fetus is going to come there or not so there is an intrauterine pregnancy that's all and you don't know whether there's going to be one fetus inside two fetus inside or three fetus inside so we don't see the number of fetus is there and the sac corresponds to around 5 weeks or so so repeat scan at 12 weeks so viability and number so here again is a is a case study and uh, the question of ultrasound so this is an irregular kind of gestational sac to see whether it is a sorry whether it is a, a miscarriage or no now there are standard criteria for miscarriage uh, the iso criteria are there i recommend people go through the criteria and always correlate your measurements with your uh, with your report now basic rules report intra extra uterine report number of fetuses only after cardiac activity is seen use to establish cut off for viability and when in doubt always give the benefit of doubt to the baby and remember about 70% of mcd twin are reported as singleton in early pregnancy and that's important to know now when you do the report that we have text and images the question is how many images are supposed to take iswag recommends 15 images but when you follow the rule of 3 there are 27 images that are need to be taken that's what is given in this and this picture this this pdf is available again for as a reference 27 images in the second trimester target scan so this is the kind of checklist which you can create and you can do it when you do that so from the history you get indications for scan from the survey you say single live fetus from the biometry you put the values and weeks remember to report always biometry values and the weeks not say fetus corresponds to 16 weeks fetus corresponds to 18 weeks even if she is your own patient please don't do that always put the print the biometry values targeted scan all fetal organs image are normal for period of gestation you should mention organs which are not seen 
and fetal activity, cardiac activity and heart rate, fetal movement normal, fetal environment, placenta anterior, like a radicoid, and final impression should be summary of relevant findings. Now, these are there are automated software that are available now. Most of the, uh, the calculation of the percentiles and the gestational age, expected date of delivery, all this can be done and the graph plotting can be done automatically. Now, remember when you want to date the pregnancy, always date by the early scan after eight weeks. Never date a pregnancy before eight weeks. The ideal time, of course, is after 10 weeks. And do not change the dates with each scan. Do not use the machine generated values blindly. The machine gives you all this. Don't copy this and put it in your report because that could be wrong if the patient has had an altered uh, um, uh, alteration of the gestational age early. Now, when you want to report fetal anatomy, all fetal parts images, no anomaly seen, all fetal parts imaged, no anomaly seen, then baby born with a facial cleft. So when you say fetus is normal and the baby is born with a defect, that's when parents get very, uh, very uh, alarmed. So here, head, spine, heart, limbs, stomach, kidneys seen and appear normal. Fetal face could not be imaged as the face due to, uh, due to fetal position. And so when we put this, the baby bounce the cleft rate, then you so we tried to look for the face, we could not do it. This, this has happened. So we can report anatomy in various ways. You could go in a detailed manner or you could go in a short manner. But remember, every sentence you put, you are owning up a sentence. When you say the word normal, it means you have seen it completely and you are given a judgment call that the baby is normal. So the checklist approach. So here. Uh, here's the report. Twin, twin gestation at 17, 18 weeks, placenta anterior, AFI 12, normal liker. Now this report is completely wrong because it's a dichoronic twin gestation 17, 18, placenta anterior, normal liker because we don't do AFI at that point. Similarly, single fetus and unstable lie. It's a very common to say unstable lie at 19, 20 weeks. When you use the word unstable, the parents get very worried that their baby is very unstable. I think you should not use these terminologies and say because the baby, you don't need to know the lie of the, the lie of the fetus is only for anatomical evaluation at that point of time. Allow the baby to roam around whichever way it wants. You don't need to worry about it. Now, so similarly, placenta posterior grade one in maturity. It is high time that we give up on placental grading. Please do not write grading and maturity of the placenta. It's a complete waste of time and has no meaning at all. So, but you should say placenta is posterior whether it is not low lying or is high. So single fetus and cephalic placenta are 35 weeks, placenta arterial like a subjectively less, AFI 9. This is completely wrong again. Because if you are doing AFI, uh, AFI 8 to 20 is normal. Between 5 to 8 is borderline oligohydranus, less than 5. So use those terminology specifically and this AFI is within normal level. Now, the other thing is improbable report. Single fetus are 18 weeks. Right heart of the fetus shows bradycardia and left heart shows tachycardia. This is actually a, a report which came from a scan center and, and done by a qualified person. So please remember. And we just need to say cardiac exit. Now, reporting on placenta, placental position in relation to internal, measure the distance. Now, placenta previa. Uh, appropriate uh, American College of Radiology appropriate criteria recommend description of the relationship between the lowermost edge of the placenta and internal loss distance less than two centimeters. We've already said that. Now remember placenta previa. When you report placenta previa in the first trimester, it should not be reported. In my opinion, you should not report placenta previa in the first trimester and second trimester because five to thirty percent of the cases you will see placenta covering the loss in the second trimester. But in the third trimester, is only 0.6%. So it's because of trophotropism, and we don't need to unnecessarily scare the patient. Now, placental grading, never done. It's obsolete, and please do not report grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. And also, uh, when you do want to evaluate the cervix, always transfer general to be done. Now, the, then lastly, disclaimer. This report is not valid for medical legal purposes. You can't put a disclaimer like that because, of course, it, it, it is a medical legal document and you will be pulled up when, when it is required if you have not done something right. 
and all anomalies cannot be diagrams by ultrasound that's fine there are disclaimers which can which you can put because specific disclaimers in second trimester and specific disclaimers in the third trimester you can do that but you can you you have to say when the baby is born for anomaly you only need to prove that part of the anatomy you have documented and once you have documented and say that i thought this was normal for example baby born with cleft lip you have already taken mouth and uh, uh, the mouth and you have documented it that i have seen the mouth so it was a judgment call and it was not negligence so you need to just say that you had actually seen it and at the time the anomaly was either not present or it could not be detected at the time explain limitations high bmi and poor visualization of fetal anatomy and you can say visualized parts of the fetus appear normal that means there are certain parts which are not being visible so make the report simple and easily readable document structure is not seen and don't report the improbable so thank you very much for our patient listening and i'll be happy to answer any questions uh, if there are